Hello guys, Nika here. Happy Friday. So I like scrunching up my face because I know my mom is probably watching and it drives her crazy. So yeah. Hi mom. But before you guys bash me for being on here on a Friday night, yeah, I know. I just got out of work. It's, it's like almost nine here in Chicago and I've been up probably since three in the morning. So I am a little bit tired, but I figured what better way than to start the weekend with something fun that we all like to do here. And that's discuss the Idaho 4 case because it's interesting. Before we get started though, I do want to share a fun fact. And maybe some of you guys already know this because I understand that several of my followers have followed me since sometimes from a decade or even longer when I used to have those other channels before I got banned. But a lot of you guys are new. So don't feel bad for me. If you ever see me uploading on a weekend, don't be, don't, don't feel bad and, and assume that I'm just losing myself to this case because I'm an introvert and I love reading. I love learning. I love dissecting things, stories, learning about people. And I've always had friends. I've never had problems making friends, but ever since I was little, I always had a small group of friends and I loved staying indoors, reading books. Yeah, I was that nerd. And my favorite thing to do as a child was go with my dad to the Scholastic Book Fair. I'm probably dating myself. Do you guys remember those? The Scholastic Book Fair, that was like the best thing ever. Like you could walk around, buy awesome books, and then you could just bring them home in a cool bag and read them. No? Anyone? Anyone else? Does anyone remember those? Yeah, they were the shit. So that's what I'm going to do on my Friday night. And because I am starting a new channel from scratch, some of you guys may not know me. And I feel like a good way for us to get to know each other is maybe you can share a fun fact, something personal or something interesting about yourself in the comment section. Because I just think it's so cool that we can build a community here on YouTube with each other, with people across the world and just talk about interesting things that we like to talk about and we can have opposing views. I'm okay with that as long as you're being respectful. I'm all about listening to other people's opinions about this case or anything for that matter. So let me know something funny or crazy or interesting about yourself in the comments. But because I am an introvert and a freaking book nerd, book nerd, book worm, both probably, I was going through the affidavit here, pulling it up one more time. And it seems that every time I go through the affidavit, I find something that just sticks out like a freaking sore thumb. And these of course are my personal opinions. As you guys know, I don't watch other YouTubers. I don't really have the time for it due to my current work schedules. So I basically turn my phone on and just start talking to the phone and I have a laptop and that's it. I mean, my setup is embarrassing. I have like a stack of books here. It's, it's my office. <laughs> so I'm not sure if other people have talked about this or not, but personal opinion, weird one sentence that I see today. I'd read it before, but I it didn't, it didn't click. And then today I'm like, what is Moscow law enforcement doing? Are they intentionally trying to mislead us? Or was this, something they had to put in the affidavit to cover themselves or none of this is making sense anymore. First, Moscow LE is telling us that Brian is probably guilty because he connected, well, his cell phone connected to these towers and that apparently places them at the crime scene, which by the way, it does not people. It does not. 
But check this sentence out. It's embarrassing how Moscow is, it's all, I'm not gonna say they are hiding it because they'll probably, they'll probably sue me. So I have to say, these are my personal opinions. You do your own research, come to your own conclusions, blah, 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 blah. But tell me, what, what do you take away from this sentence? Because for me, this just keeps getting crazier. Investigators found that the 8458 phone, that's Brian's phone, did connect to a cell phone tower that provides service to Moscow on November 14, 2022. That's the day after the murders, by the way. But investigators do not believe the 8458 phone was in Moscow on that date. Wait, 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 what, 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 what? So, Moscow LE is saying that Brian's phone connected to a cell phone tower that provides service to Moscow, but they don't think his phone was actually in Moscow. What does that point to? Because to me, it seems that that's an indirect way of saying that your cell phone triangulation method may not be so accurate. If I were Ann Taylor, I would dissect the crap out of that. That to me, that one sentence in the entire affidavit could potentially bring down the whole freaking case. Because I wanna know, so you think Brian was outside of Moscow, yet his phone connected to a tower in Moscow. So which is it? Are the pings actually accurate? Because now you're saying they're not, potentially. You can't have both, people. You can't have both. You can't just say that every other ping was accurate. Oh, but then this random ping, yeah, that, that one is not. So how did he connect with that cell phone tower in Moscow if he wasn't in Moscow? Make up your mind, Moscow law enforcement. And one could say, well, maybe he left his phone somewhere, potentially, but you could also say that for everything else. You could say maybe somebody drove the vehicle or maybe he was on foot, but we're not going to, we're not going to go in that direction because it opens up a whole can of worms. Now, I understand how cell tower triangulation works, but it can be very difficult to explain that to a, to an average person because it gets very messy, depending on the tower, depending on the location, depending on the strength of the signals, it can mean a variety of things. The, obviously the more cell towers that are in, for example, an urban area like Chicago, like here we have towers everywhere, there's constant signal and it's very accurate. But remember, guys, where this crime took place. Remember, Moscow, Idaho, and its surroundings, as well as Pullman, Washington, where Brian lived, and its surroundings, has some vast open spaces. And that often means that there are way less cell towers, which means that these pings are way less reliable. Not only that, but I pulled up a study by, let's see here if I can find it for you guys. Okay, by the University of New Hampshire. And I will try to attach these to the description of the video, but just bear with me because the last video I uploaded took me like three hours to upload. So then I have to wait to attach these. But if you guys have the time, I do want you to go through these 
couple of links that I'm going to share with you because it shows how cell tower triangulation is not what most people think it is. And it reminds me so much of the DNA, the IgG testing, because when you actually break down the science, it's like, mm, yeah, it can be useful, but it turns out that it's actually mm, it has a lot of issues as well. And you definitely have to keep in mind that it could be potentially just junk evidence. So the study immediately says cell phones do not always connect to the closest cell tower. That alone says a lot because Brian's phone pinged doesn't mean that he was there. It could potentially mean that his phone just connected for another reason. What does the study say those other reasons could be? It says, because cell phones do not always connect to the cell tower that is physically closest, but to the one with the strongest signal. This may or not be due to the phone's location. The potential risks of overvaluing a cell tower's location relative to the phone's actual location can be illustrated by the dangerous problems resulting from their reliance on tower location in developments in the United States 911 routing system. So this study by this university is telling us we cannot rely on this data to tell us that a person was in a location at a specific moment in time because it is also likely that they didn't connect to the closest tower. It is likely that they could have just connected to one that had a stronger signal that was even further away, making this whole affidavit, this whole case, potentially just a junk case. Because if Ann Taylor questions this and questions scientific validity of how they got these pings and how they got these cell tower triangulation pings. And it's not scientifically valid. This case would just be thrown out immediately. I mean, the study here is telling us do not overvalue because of how dangerous it is. And I'm going to share with you guys this example. It's so eye opening when you read these stories that by the way are quite common per this study and when you when i share this example with you then compare it to brian's pings and see where the potential failures could have been when using these pings and this is crazy. I feel bad for this this story, this this person that I'm about to, to to tell you about because this could happen to anybody. And this says, for example, after sustaining a head injury, a pregnant woman called 911 from a playground in Burlington County, New Jersey. But the cell phone she connected to routed her to a dispatch in Philadelphia. Can you imagine that poor pregnant woman after taking a freaking injury to the head calls 911 while she's in Jersey but instead they connect her to, to Philly? And per Google Maps, it's 28 miles away. 28 miles away. That story is something to keep in mind. Because again, it's pointing out that it is a fallacy. It's false that cell phones 
do not always connect to the nearest tower. So just because Brian happened to connect to those towers doesn't mean he was even nearby. He could have been 40 miles away. I mean, 28 miles away per, per this example. Not to mention that he only lived a few miles away from where the crime actually took place. So is it possible that Brian Koberger was just living his life normally, his regular insomniac self driving out and about and connecting to random towers? It is possible. It's very possible. And this example of this pregnant lady being connected to a location that was almost 30 miles away versus the one closest to her is enough for me to say that this data, it's not enough to say that Brian Koberger was at the crime scene. It's not enough. And just to remind you guys, Brian doesn't have to prove his innocence. So many of us forget that in the course of crimes, horrific crimes, especially dealing with young people. And like I mentioned yesterday, it's very easy to get emotional about these things and to immediately want to place blame on Brian Koberger. But at the end of the day, the American justice system is not one where the defendant has to prove his innocence. He has to prove the prosecutors, the state of Idaho has to prove the Brian is guilty. So keep that in mind when you're analyzing this. It's very easy to get carried away but what by what average people who have no no background in methodologies of cell tower triangulation or the DNA IgG testing. Again, these words, often people will assume, oh, it's technology. It never fails. But there are errors and they have to be accounted for. Just because this system of cell tower triangulation is used by law enforcement doesn't mean that there are no mistakes. Doesn't mean that they're doing what they need to do properly. And I always come back to, it's important for us to hold law enforcement accountable. I understand that in the affidavit, Moscow law enforcement didn't have to go into detail about the math that is utilized to get these pings. But when the trial begins, that's going to come up. We want to see metrics. I want to see math. Show me trigonometry if you need to. Show me how you got those pings. Because from what I'm reading in the affidavit, you, Moscow, Moscow, I always say Moscow, Moscow, law enforcement, You, you appear to be contradicting yourself all of a sudden in one little sentence. What would you do? Imagine, and this is just me speculating, imagine you're out and about doing your regular 
night driving because you do it every night. And you haven't to, to connect to these towers with the strongest signals. And that's not even the road you're on. And then some horrific crime happens in the town that you were driving in or driving through. And they happen to catch a blurry image of a vehicle that kind of looks like yours. They don't have any pictures of you coming out of the vehicle. So they don't know it's actually you. The picture's too blurry. But they say, what the hell? Let's take you in anyway. Your car is like the one in the picture, sort of, kind of. And you know what? We are Moscow law enforcement. What does law enforcement do best? We close cases. That's what we do. That's what we are taught to do. Let's close this case. Let's jail the bad guy ASAP. Because that means that our community is safe. But for us, who have spent time behind the scenes learning about law enforcement, the psychology of law enforcement and how there are feelings within law enforcement and how oftentimes law enforcement is too focused on trying to make the crime fit because their task is to close the case. That on its own should be a failure obvious to everyone of our justice system. Personally, I believe that the goal of law enforcement shouldn't be to close cases. The goal should be to find the actual criminal so that we're actually safe. And not only told that we're safe, but that we're actually safe. But when we have police departments who are oftentimes short-staffed, who are oftentimes stressed, who are oftentimes overworked, who oftentimes have several officers with severe unaddressed mental health issues, mental health concerns, what do you think is going to come out of the whole thing? People are pressured Officers are pressured to close these cases. I'm not blaming the officers. What I'm saying is that we have to understand the failings of our system so that we can do better because I know we can do better. Again, I'm not anti-authoritarian. I'm not anti-police. I'm not anti-anything. I was a veteran. I've had members within several government agencies. That's not the issue. But we still have to hold them accountable. I'm not trying to make them or paint them as a bad guy. Because at the end of the day, police officers do a lot for our communities. And in my opinion, most officers aren't bad people. They're normal people trying to do good within their communities. But you guys, you can't make the crime fit. You can't just take evidence that somehow sort of could pass for a person such as Brian. Oh, well, look, maybe, maybe he did it. He's kind of creepy. He's got a 
a white car similar to the blurry one in the picture. Oh, and you know what? Look, his phone, his phone pings show that he took the route to the houses where the crime was committed. Dun, dun, dun. Or did they? Did his phone actually do that? Or is it the case of the pregnant lady with the head injury? Is he just connecting to random towers in Moscow? It appears to me that it's highly likely. And remember guys, remember that phrase, Page 15, go to the affidavit yourself. It's right underneath the supposed route, his, his phone, ping to. And right there, as clear as day, it states that the phone connected to that Moscow tower but they don't think his phone was there. So, I don't know. It is interesting. It is interesting. Is it just me that gets that vibe that they're just trying to make the crime fit to Brian? It seems like a lot of energy, effort, resources of the entire community have just been poured into this case. I just saw a story about how somebody donated a million dollars to the police department because they want this case solved. But you know how you solve this case, Moscow LE? You solve it by actually trying to find who committed the crime. and questioning all of the potential suspects. And it's funny because a lot of people who are open to immediately blaming Brian Koberger say, Nika, you're, you're overthinking this. Why are you overthinking this? Obviously the simplest solution, Occam's razor, right? Is the answer meaning Brian did it, the crime fits. But I tell those people, is it the simplest solution? Because to me, the simplest solution would be to blame it on the two survivors. Isn't that the simplest solution? You're telling me that Finding a white Elantra, although there's thousands of them in that area. A blurry Elantra, you're gonna pin it on one random guy and his pings are obviously contradicting per your statement here in the affidavit. And Brian had no connections to these people. And per the timeline, it makes it highly unlikely that he alone committed the crime. You're telling me that that's easier trying to find all this and pin it on Brian than to actually suspect the two survivors? No, it is not. Of course, pinning it on the two survivors is the easiest solution. I'm not saying that is what law enforcement should be doing. I'm saying that is much easier than the whole Brian case. 
You know why? Because they were actually physically at the crime scene. They can't even pin Brian at the crime scene because all this is junk evidence in my opinion. So if you're gonna use Occam's razor to try to tell me that I'm insane, I'm gonna say you're insane. You have two girls who are physically in the crime scene, who now we know were awake, who were immediately ruled out as suspects, who failed to call the police. And when one of them finally got a hold of one of their friends, their friend called the police eight hours later. We have a camera 50 feet away from where the crime took place that picked up the whimpers, dog barking, loud thud, 50 feet away. And you're gonna tell me these two girls in this house didn't hear a thing? I'm not buying it. I'm not saying Brian wasn't involved, but if I had to pick one or the other, I would say there's more evidence pointing to the survivors. But only time will tell. And time makes it so that the truth always comes out. I know some people don't believe that, but it's just a matter of time. My problem with the just a matter of time is that during this time, we have a man sitting in solitary confinement almost a year with this shoddy junk evidence. And we have two girls who are immediately ruled out, who have restarted their lives, partying, doing who knows what. It looks like they're having fun per their new Instagram posts. It seems just a touch unfair to me. But again, only time will tell. So we will see how long this video takes to upload. Hopefully not too long. And I'm going to go get some sleep now because I'm going to pass out soon probably. Um, I hope you guys have a great Friday night. If you are not an introvert like myself, if you're out and about, make sure to be safe out there. I mean, if you're out drinking with friends, whatever it is, always have someone with you. Always have someone with you. Have a buddy system, have something. Because when you introduce drugs or alcohol into the mix, Statistically, you're more likely to end up in a situation like the Idaho 4 case. So always use a buddy system, always have phone, a way to protect yourself, always. And stay safe, that's, that's all I can say. I guess I should go to sleep now. <laughs>